Good evening, everyone. I'm Rob Murray. Alongside me is Aiden Rupert, and welcome to episode 11 of the WCHC Sports Podcast, where we discuss the latest news and updates from around the sports world. Well, folks, over two months of bubble basketball have finally come to an end, and the 2020 NBA champions are the Los Angeles Lakers. We'll discuss their 4-2 series victory over the Miami Heat and what this means for the legacy of LeBron James, the conclusion of an action-packed MLB division series, and an almost full slate of Sunday football as the NFL continues to brave more COVID-19 cases around the league. And maybe we'll be nice enough to throw in some tennis talk at the end as well. But given that it is the end of yet another NFL Sunday, I got to know, Aiden, how the fantasy team do? And win or loss, who was your breakout performer? So the fantasy situation, Rob, as you know, the NFL, as we will get into a little bit later on, they really had to do some creative scheduling to make things fit for this week, given some of the positive COVID test results that are creeping up. So the result yet to be determined. I'm actually going to have to wait until Tuesday night to see how I fared this week, although all my players are done. I'm just waiting on Buffalo to get things kicked off Tuesday night. But I'll tell you who it wasn't, Rob. Matt Ryan came up with fewer than seven fantasy points for me today in really an underwhelming performance. Um, But on the flip side of that, Ezekiel Elliott, he really came through for his team in light of the gruesome Dak Prescott injury, which we will also discuss briefly later on. So Shout out to Ezekiel Elliott. He has me in position to win, you know, take projections with a grain of salt, but I am favored by 13 points right now. That's funny you bring up Zeke and Matt Ryan, actually, because Zeke was my first round pick uh, in my league that I run uh, as the commissioner. Uh, And he's been obviously the model of consistency, consistency for both fantasy and real life football. I think he put up over 20 points again. And Matt Ryan is a guy I've been looking at as a nice waiver wire ad since my quarterback was Dak Prescott, and he went through that terrible entry today. But yeah, after today's performance, and given that his last three performances, I don't think he's cracked over 12 points. Uh, I'm going to stay away from Matt Ryan and, and go a little younger and maybe pick up a Gardner Minshew or maybe a Justin Herbert, but we'll see uh, where that takes me. Uh, but enough about fantasy. Let's get right into the NBA, Aiden, because the Los Angeles Lakers have just won their first title in a decade since Kobe and Pau's team went back to back against the Orlando Magic in 09 and unfortunately your Boston Celtics in 2010. And Aiden, I think it's only fitting that the Lakers did win it all this year, given everything that's happened, uh, not only Kobe's death, but all else that's gone wrong in the world. So I'd like to get your thoughts on Los Angeles really bringing a team together this quickly uh, and in such a short amount of time and bringing it all together with their chemistry and winning a championship. And furthermore, what this means for the legacy of LeBron James winning his fourth title with his third team, along with his fourth finals MVP in year 17 in the league. Yeah, Rob. Well, first and foremost, let me just say that it seems surreal in a sense, even to think that this is over. Obviously, we are not accustomed even to having professional basketball at this time of year, as we just wrapped up a few minutes ago, the longest NBA season in history by a mile. And so I'm definitely going to miss just having the weeknight or weekend basketball to watch sort of carry me through my fall semester if, if you know what I, if, what I mean by that. But um, for, in terms of LeBron, I mean, obviously we knew from the get-go there were going to be a whole lot of narratives out there on him and what exactly this bubble championship means in the grand scope of things. Um, I want to touch on Skip Bayless's take from just a few days ago, who had the audacity, Rob, to say that winning this title in Orlando will actually ultimately serve to hurt LeBron James's legacy, which is something that I want to address right now. I understand the argument of, yeah, it was a bubble. Things were different. Get, put the asterisk next to the title. Like say, do with that what you will. The opponents that LeBron James had to go through in this postseason, even though he dodged the Clippers, 
even though he dodged the Bucks. Let's not just sit back and pretend that he was playing against against a bunch of plumbers, as the saying goes. First round, Portland Trailblazers. Damian Lillard's a Hall of Famer. C.J. McCollum, you never know. It's unlikely. He could be a Hall of Famer. Second round, Westbrook, James Harden, Hall of Famers, Conference Finals, Nikola Jokic. You better believe he'll be a Hall of Famer eventually if all goes according to plan. And in the NBA Finals, we talk so much about how the right team got hot at the right time, and that was the Miami Heat. And unfortunately, they themselves ran into some injury problems along the way. But the LA Lakers, they really never had the series in too, too much doubt, even though the Heat managed to force a game six. So in terms of LeBron, it's now his third finals MVP, pardon, fourth finals MVP with a third different team, which is something no one has ever done before. Obviously, Kawhi Leonard was looking to do the same thing this season and wasn't able to get the job done. And so LeBron with four championships, I think he's right up there. And if you just look at the all-time numbers and the all-time dominance, he's really close. And one last point, Rob, I feel like there's very little you can do at this point. I think that if you don't think LeBron is the greatest of all time, I'm not sure a fifth championship, maybe not even a sixth is going to put you there in terms of comparing him to Michael Jordan. But what a season it was for LeBron, as well as Anthony Davis and really the Lakers supporting cast. It really was, Aiden. Um, And, you know, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, their ability to construct that roster in really the span of a year, get a new coach, get guys to surround LeBron James and develop the chemistry necessary to win a championship and go on a deep playoff run was honestly remarkable. Granted, they did have a little extra time over the COVID lockdown, so I'm not sure, you know, how much they got to see of each other uh, during that time. But uh, it's certainly hard to win a championship in any sport, especially when you have guys uh, all in the same room who really aren't that familiar with one another. And, you know, with regards to the LeBron argument against Jordan, um, you know where my loyalty is always going to lie. As a Bulls fan, I'm always going to ride with my guy Jordan, but you know, with this title and the way LeBron has performed year in and year out for, you know, almost two decades now that he's approaching, uh, I will admit my case for Jordan being the greatest of all time is becoming harder and harder to make each year. And I think I will slowly start uh, to lose some of these arguments with friends and family about who is the greatest of all time. It's, it's difficult. Um, you, you, Rob, sorry to interrupt, but you will, yeah, no. you will one day see a last dance type documentary for LeBron James, as we are without a doubt seeing greatness unfold before us. And one thing I also just want to get your take on real quick is speaking of the legacy of LeBron James, Magic Johnson actually had an, a pretty interesting point that I had never really considered before. And that's that LeBron James essentially put so much added pressure on himself in this move to LA. And I think there's a lot to that. Obviously you look at the roster right now, they have Anthony Davis. So that's one thing you can look at that as the greatest teammate, perhaps LeBron has played with. If you consider him that highly above Dwayne Wade at that point in their respective careers. But a year ago, they didn't have Anthony Davis. I'm sure that sort of the idea was out there. I'm sure <laughs> Some people did see it coming, to be fair, but LeBron was basically going to a roster that was much worse off than the Cleveland Cavaliers team he was departing. And that's not the gist of Magic Johnson's argument. His argument is look at all of the Laker legends that preceded him. You talk about the Kareems, the Kobe's, the Shaq's, the Jerry West's, everybody. And so LeBron, if he were to take his talents out to LA, play, say, four or five seasons there, and come up empty every year, where is that going to leave him in terms of the the um, the Mount Rushmore of Laker legends, right? So I, I think that was an interesting take by Magic Johnson. Um, I think so, there's a lot to be said for it, even though he's playing alongside an Anthony Davis right now. Just there was a lot of pressure on him, pandemic or no pandemic. There certainly was. And I, I do think LeBron knew that he was eventually going to get help, whether or not that was in year one, maybe he didn't know. I don't think he would have made the move to Los Angeles as attractive as a destination it is. Um, I don't think he would have made the move if he didn't think that he would get a guy like Anthony Davis or, you know, a Kawhi Leonard who he was very close to getting uh, last year in free agency. 
Um, but let's circle back to the heat, Aiden, because you know they they were facing an uphill climb. I think both of us can agree from the start of the series, and you really just have to commend the playoff run they went on and the adversity they were able to overcome. Uh, not only in the first few rounds of the postseason where they went twelve and three in Eastern Conference play, but in the finals where they were staring down two nothing and three one deficits and were able to scratch wins from the Lakers. Uh, behind just all-time great performances from Jimmy Butler, uh, who played 47 minutes in game five, by the way, which, you know, you, you see the picture circulating social media with his head in his hands, just hanging over that barrier behind the basket. He was exhausted. And I think it did show tonight. He only took 10 shots. He shot 50%. You know, that, that's good for an NBA starter, but you could tell he just wasn't all there. He poured everything he had into that last Miami Heat win, but um, the Heat only five seed to make the NBA Finals. I think they've got a great future ahead of them with all the young stars they have in Hero and Bam and Robinson and Kendrick Nunn. And now they have a leader in Jimmy Butler who is now clearly a bona fide star. And I'm not afraid to say that um, because a lot of times it takes performances like the ones he had on the biggest stage to be recognized as one of the league's elite. And who knows, maybe they get a little lucky in free agency. Maybe they can work out a trade deal. I've heard Giannis as a potential name uh, to make his way over to Miami in the next year or two if things don't work out in Milwaukee. So um, Heat fans, I know it's been a while since uh, you guys hoisted the trophy um, going back to 2012 and LeBron, but I'm very excited about their future and their ability to compete in the Eastern Conference with teams like, you know, Milwaukee and Boston and Toronto moving forward. Well, Rob, I'm really, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that last piece, and that is cap flexibility in terms of the money they have available to spend this offseason and beyond. They're not tied down to any atrocious contracts, as are so many other teams. Um, and so who knows, maybe a year from now it is a Giannis. Personally, I hope not. And I'm glad Giannis has stated publicly his loyalties to the state of Wisconsin. But I also think that Jimmy Butler, to me, he's a guy whose game is going to age extremely well. He's obviously a physical, physical player, but he's not over-reliant on his athleticism. He's really a skilled guy with tremendous upper body strength. And what is he now, like 30, somewhere 29 to 31, something like that. I, I don't see really a drop off in the immediate future for Jimmy Butler. I think he has a good five years ahead of him at sort of this peak level of stardom. And it's, it, it is interesting, Rob, you mentioned like the, the Kendrick nuns, the Tyler heroes, they sort of are facing the same sort of dilemma, which is a good dilemma to have as the Boston Celtics were a year ago. And that's having these two timelines, like sure they can embrace the youth movement, alongside Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson, although he is a little bit older for a second year player, um, Kendrick Nunn, et cetera. But they also have the pieces right now, like the Kelly Olynyx, even Solomon Hill, we saw in the finals, uh, he, he scored a few buckets late. Um, yeah, Goran Dragic, I think he's entering free agency himself, but obviously the Heat, they have a lot of flexibility in terms of what they end up doing moving forward. And you best believe that the top free agents if they're not going out and enjoying the LA beaches, you know where there's some pretty good beaches down south is in Miami. So I wouldn't be surprised to see the Heat positioned to make runs next season and beyond. That's right. In, uh, and Jimmy Butler was 30, by the way, just looked it up for you. So uh, you were right in the middle there. Um, I do agree, though, that I think the Heat, much like the Celtics did last season coming into this year, uh, they have the ability to simultaneously simultaneously develop their young talent and strike while the iron's hot, so to speak, and go out and get uh, another star player like the Celtics did with Kemba Walker. Um, and, you know, I'm going to transition into our early predictions for 2021. I see the Heat as, again, in that top four discussion in the Eastern Conference. If they get another piece, uh, I can see them being a top two team. Uh, considering how valuable playoff experiences like this can be to a young group of players. I'm going to echo my Chicago Cubs back in 2015 
really great young team, had a lot of, you know, players coming up from the minor leagues who were ready to make an impact, got all the way to the National League Championship Series and got swept by the New York Mets, unfortunately. But the very next year with that playoff experience under the belt, they went on to win a World Series. So I think the Heat are primed to take the leap and be a mainstay in that Eastern Conference. Um, we talked about before the show, actually, the Clippers with their new coach, um, TBD and Doc Rivers going to the Nets. Or I'm sorry, not the Nets, the Sixers. Steve Nash is going to the Nets. But yeah, I think 2021 will be a continuation of 2020 in that uh, there's a lot more parity in the league now. I think the West will still be owned by and forced to go through LeBron James. But um, it, it's exciting. I think there'll be a lot of moves this offseason that shape the playoff field in 2021. I'm interested to get your thoughts on some of these teams like the Clippers and Milwaukee uh, who feel like they might need to move things around to really secure that finals berth and a championship moving forward. Well, Rob, let me just say I'm glad we're having this discussion as you best believe that even minutes after this season just concluded, I'm already keeping one eye toward the future. But at the same time, so much remains to be seen. We don't even know the date of next season, when it's going to start. It's, according to Adam Silver, almost certainly going to be after Christmas. But as we mentioned in previous shows, so much of it is dependent on the development and availability of a vaccine. If um, team owners and governors are looking to have fans in their arenas and really just, I can't imagine this is sort of an aside. I can't imagine being a rookie coming into a league in this state. Obviously the NBA put forth a tremendous effort in pulling this bubble in Orlando off uh, almost seamlessly, quite honestly. Uh, but just in terms of how much work the league executives are going to have for themselves over the next few months and just scheduling all of this and making sure everyone's happy, I certainly do not envy anyone involved. Uh, but enough about that. In terms of the next season, Rob, how about the Golden State Warriors? We cannot forget about them. They are, That's a great point. They're just a year removed from their dynasty. And who knows, maybe it was sort of just a gap year. Maybe it is sort of LeBron's turn to reign the West, but so much remains to be seen and seen. And the Los Angeles Clippers, I think that they're going to come at next season with a very similar roster construction construction to that they presented this year. Um, But who knows when someone else is at the helm as their head coach, anything can happen. I've frankly have no idea what direction they're going to look to go in their head coaching pursuit. And then out, uh, also, you have to mention the Denver Nuggets. They've gotten better and better every year. So um, you mentioned parity, Rob, and I think that's, that's a fine way to put it as the Warriors are finally playing with something to prove. The Lakers are proving that this year was no fluke. The Clippers are playing with a lot to prove. And the Rockets, they're just probably going to try the same small ball thing over and watch it fail in the playoffs. But out East, yeah, I, I do wonder what the roster construction is going to look like for Milwaukee, if they're going to make a push for Chris Paul out of Oklahoma city, it could happen. Um, you know, the narrative on the Celtics is they have nowhere to go, but up given this season was frankly a disappointment in that they couldn't top the heat to reach the finals. And then you have no idea what the Sixers are going to look like. Um, I expect a decline from the Raptors, although I never want to count out Nick nurse and Kyle Lowry as well as Siakam, if he can sort of put the finishing touches on his game. So I'm not brave enough, Rob, to even make a finals prediction for next year. But let me just say I am really looking forward to it. And obviously prayers out to the league that they can pull this off nearly as aimlessly as they did or um, flawlessly as they did in pulling off the Orlando bubble. Yeah, and I think a playoff prediction right now would be foolish instead of brave, uh, considering, like I said, the amount of parity in the league we're seeing now. Uh, and the amount of teams playing with something to prove. Um, But let's move on to baseball, who uh, is approaching their own championship round. A field of what used to be 16 teams is down to four. We have the number one seeded Tampa Bay Rays against the number four seeded Houston Astros in the American League Championship Series, hosted by Petco Park in San Diego. Obviously, Major League Baseball faring well with their own bubble format here in the postseason. And in the National League, we have the first-seeded Dodgers against the second-seeded Atlanta Braves down in Arlington, Texas. 
So postseason race heating up. We have October baseball again. The Astros, who have been the villains of not only this season, but seasons of past, um, given that their cheating scandal came out a short time ago, they're five and one this postseason and took care of a very strong Oakland A's team and their top three bullpen they have out there. They're currently actually in a 2 1 game in the bottom of the eighth against the Rays right now. They are down, looking to make a comeback. So, you know, unfortunately, to the anger of a lot of MLB fans, the Astros are playing with, I think, a big chip on their shoulder uh, and echoing things you were saying about teams like the Clippers and the Warriors and the Lakers next season. The Astros have a lot to prove. A lot of people have cast doubt over their legitimacy and ability to win a championship, given that the last time they did win one, they were stealing signs and cheating uh, off of other teams. Uh, But they're certainly making a legit case right now here in 2020. Their opponent, the Rays, sorry to cut you off, and I'll I'll let you hop in as I wrap up the AL here. Um, The Rays dispatched a red-hot Yankees team uh, who came into the postseason hot and continued uh, hitting the ball really well uh, against the Indians in the first round and the Rays up until game five. Uh, third baseman Mike Brasso hit an eighth inning home run off of closer Aroldis Chapman in game five to mark Chapman's second year in a row, giving up a game losing homer in an elimination game. Sorry, Yankees fans. And it underscored a subtle yet really interesting rivalry uh, that transpired over this 2020 season. And Aiden, MLB beefs are no stranger to this podcast. We discussed the A's and the Astros with Ramon Laureano. We discussed Fernando Tatis and the Texas Rangers. Um, But we have not talked about Aroldis Chapman, Mike Brasso, and the Yankees' Rays rivalry. Um, In the middle of the season, Chapman threw at Brasso's head. And it's crazy to think now that Brasso is the one that ended Chapman and the Yankees' season He claims he felt there was no karma uh, or ill will involved in that home run. But uh, as a former baseball player and just athlete overall, I'm sure you can attest to this as well. I'm sure he thought deep down uh, hitting a home run off a guy that threw at his head earlier certainly felt good. Um, And the Rays feel good as they're moving on and sit just four outs away from a game one victory. So let me get your thoughts on uh, these two teams in the AL championship series. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you who doesn't feel good right now. And that's New York Yankees. Um, You know, they got off to, or they really hit their stride um, partway through the condensed season. And they had some high expectations for themselves as well as from others and ultimately came up short of that. And I just also want to note what a deflating loss it was for the Yankees organization as Friday marked, or rather Thursday night, marks the passing of all-time Yankees great Whitey Ford at the age of 91. And so the team was playing right on the heels of that loss, having announced it just earlier. And so Ford was the team's all-time wins leader and played all 16 years of his MLB career in New York, earning 10 all-star appearances and six world championships. And so obviously it's very different than playing on the heels of a tragedy such as that of Kobe Bryant back in January, but talk about like a player who did so much for the franchise. It's, it's gotta be difficult to go out there and knowing that the narrative is going to be, let's win this one for Ford and then having to come up short as a result. Um, Certainly deflating for all Yankees fans everywhere. And on the other side of things, I just want to go back to the, um, the Rays Astros series that you mentioned going on right now. We talked on this podcast just about sort of the flip side of the bubble narrative. Obviously, so many people are going to present it as, oh, well, there are no home fans. So as a road team, you can gain all the momentum in the world. So what do these mean wins really mean? But there's a distinct flip side of that. And that's that essentially you're being presented as a sports fan with the vacuum scenario. Who is the best team in a vacuum? Obviously, some things cannot be eliminated from the game altogether, such as injuries, as we just saw in the NBA Finals and really throughout the playoffs. But finally, we have a chance as sports fans to see who is the better team, not just who's the better team on paper, but when it really comes down to it, who is going to end up victorious. So 
it's it's certainly a fun narrative to watch for a team like the Houston Astros that have had really so much criticism, deservedly so. Um, it's a redemption narrative in a lot of ways. And I know really the world is still rooting against them. But if there's fuel to their fire, sort of the circumstances we were surrounded by this season, this is it. That's right. And perhaps they have been the best team in a vacuum across these past few seasons, as much as MLB fans want to hate to admit to it. Um, but let's move on to the National League. We have the number one seeded Dodgers. We've talked about them many times over the course of this podcast as the World Series favorites. Nothing has changed with regards to that. They're making their seventh National League championship appearance in their last 13 seasons, going back uh, all the way to the 2008 National League Championship Series, yet they have zero rings to show for it. And I feel like I'm a broken record saying this because I feel like I've said it every year. The Dodgers have been in contention for a World Series. Um, this is the year for them to finally bring it home. You know, they are loaded on each side of the ball. They brought in Mookie Betts this off season to round out already one of the major league baseball's best lineups. Um, and they, they really have everything to lose at this point and their opponents, the Atlanta Braves, uh, I think are playing with house money in this series because I don't think too many people are giving them a shot and they might be wrong in that because the Braves, I think are perhaps the hottest team um, of this you know, new 16 team playoff format Major League Baseball has implemented um, in response to COVID. They've outscored opponents 24 to 5 in the five postseason games they've played, and they've thrown shutouts four out of five games. They've only let opponents touch home plate in one of them, uh, and that was uh, in game two, I believe, of the NLDS against, unfortunately, our upstart Marlins that could not get the job done and win the World Series for the WCHC Sports Podcast. Uh, they're always next year. Maybe we'll have a new team for the podcast next year, but rest in peace to the Marlins. Um, and going back to the Braves, you know, unbelievable run. They're pitching and batting, firing on all cylinders uh, through their first five games. But something tells me they won't have such luck with these World Series favorite Dodgers. Can the Braves win the series? Absolutely. Anything can happen. We saw the Washington Nationals last year, a wild card team who looked like they had considerable weaknesses in comparison to the Dodgers who won 107 games that year. The Dodgers won in five in the division series. They swept the Cardinals in the championship series, and then they beat the Houston Astros in seven in the World Series. So um, like you said with the NBA, and like we both said many times before, if you're hot coming into the postseason and things are just working for you at the right time. Um, you can throw the regular season and prior performances out the window. Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate your saying that you sound like a broken record in speaking of the Dodgers. Um, but in terms of Dodgers Braves, really, I think it's fair to expect some high scoring affairs unlike the 24 to five run or outscoring run that the Dodgers have been on so far um, as frankly, the series features the two most potent offenses in the MLB. And I do think that the Dodgers, though, I do think this is their time, even without, you know, playing with a traditional closer. Um, I think that the team, it just feels a little bit different this year. And again, broken record. We say that every year. This is the time. But, um, you know, a lot's going through L.A. right now. We just talk about freaking Lakers winning it. So I think the city could definitely rejoice in some Dodgers wins right now. And they actually had this pretty cool initiative I saw. They're doing basically like a, a drive-in movie type viewing for um, this upcoming series, socially distanced, of course, but um, it's cool. I think there's a lot of energy going through LA right now, and I can't wait to see if this is indeed the year. Yeah, you talk about a lot of energy coming through LA. How about the energy through Tampa Bay as well? I mean, you had the Lightning win the Stanley Cup. You had Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski take their talents uh, to Tampa Bay and you have the Rays, you know, a couple outs away from winning game one of the American league championship series and, you know, getting as close uh, as they have to the world series since they made it back in 2008. So um, I think it's a good time to be both LA and Tampa Bay fans. And when you look back at 2020, you can say that these teams uh, definitely ruled the narratives uh, across the year in sports, but uh, let's move on to the NFL, Aiden. 
we had more postponements due to COVID-19 uh, as cases found their way to new teams this past week. We had the Broncos and the Patriots first moved um, to Monday after they were supposed to play the, uh, their game this Sunday. Now the game's been postponed. You have guys like Cam Newton and former defensive player of the year, Stefan Gilmore, among those testing positive. You had a few staff members, Bill Belichick uh, and Robert Kraft and the rest of the Patriots organization making the call to shut down their facilities today, uh, citing that they want to keep the health of their players and staff uh, first and foremost, which you know, is, of course, commendable. And the Titans, um, as you're going to attest to in a little bit, kind of the ugly duckling uh, of the NFL these last few days, they find another positive case this Sunday morning. Um, while they are still set to play Tuesday against the Bills, that casts some doubt on whether or not that contest will be played. Um, so I'd like to get your thoughts on this, Aiden. This is the second week now that the NFL has really had to stare uh, COVID right in the eye and make some big changes to their schedule on how they're going to carry out the rest of the season. The MLB had similar, you know, bouts of COVID. We talked about it much earlier on the podcast, and it seemed like once they got through that first and second wave, um, they were able to run through the rest of the season pretty smoothly. And as we've seen the postseason in these bubble formats, um, they've done very well in being able to continue play. So do you think that if the NFL is able to get through these next few weeks, um, rather unscathed in terms of scheduling that they'll be able to continue out the rest of the season and uh, most likely implement their own bubble format as we approach the postseason for football? The short answer, Rob, is I certainly hope so. There's, there's certainly a lot to dissect there. Um, going back, we, we talked about the NFL and their first wave of COVID, so to speak. Um, we talked about it last week's podcast, and I was deliberately careful about imparting too much blame on the, the Tennessee Titans because a week ago, we really didn't know the full story. We didn't know if there were any third parties responsible um, or really if there were any third variables contributing towards the super spread we've seen, seen within the organization. Um, but through some great investigative reporting, we did find out that indeed the Tennessee Titans broke every virtually every major protocol involving COVID-19 and um, the masks and the distancing required in handling a season during a pandemic. And so, as I'll talk about in a little bit during our assists and fumbles, a lot of the NFL is really ticked off at Tennessee right now, and rightfully so. Um, and I don't want to also, Rob, I don't want to lay too much into the NFL because, frankly, there's no easy answer. And I know that Commissioner Goodell and all of the executives in the league, they really have their work cut out for them trying to navigate this. But right now, let's not forget the fact that we're literally dealing with situations where teams do not know within, within 24 hours of their games whether or not they will actually be allowed to play. Because basically, it's in all but writing that if a team, say, acquires one more positive test prior to kickoff, the game's getting postponed. So how hard is that to prepare? If you're a player, if you're a coach, you just don't know when you're actually going to kick off. And not to mention the folks over at Fantasy Sports, they have no idea what they're going to do the rest of the way if these games keep getting cut off or postponed. Um, it, it's definitely a lot to deal with on the part of the NFL. And again, there's no easy answer, but I just feel for all parties involved, except for maybe the Tennessee Titans, but who knows, maybe there's something else going on there. We haven't heard yet, but it doesn't look good. Yeah. Hopefully they redeem themselves. Um, the NFL is such a fast moving league and even a day or two getting thrown off in terms of your schedule and preparation um, and practice in anticipation of a game can really throw a team's with them rhythm, excuse me, out of sorts. And, you know, when you look at teams like the Bills and the Titans and the Patriots who um, look like they're going to get multiple games moved around now, um, that could end up playing a big part in how they approach games and practices moving forward. Um, but then let's move on to the games that were actually played today. Please. Um, you had the Las Vegas Raiders 
uh, hand the defending champion Kansas City Chiefs, who actually did have their own bout of COVID early in the week. Luckily, they were able to recover from that and play. Um, the Raiders gave the Chiefs their first loss as 10 and a half point underdogs and trimmed the list of undefeated teams to just four. You have the 4 0 Packers, your 4 0 Buffalo Bills, oh Rep in Rochester. Um, the three and O Titans, like we mentioned, hopefully not for long. Hopefully they get their punishment. Uh, and the four and O Pittsburgh Steelers, who defeated their in-state rival, the Philadelphia Eagles, thirty-eight to twenty-nine today. Meanwhile, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the Giants, Jets, and perennial punching bag of the WCHC Sports Podcast, Atlanta Falcons, fall to zero and five today. Falcons actually just fired their GM and coach uh, t- earlier uh, this afternoon. So uh, things aren't looking great in those cities. I think they've put a bag on the rest of the season and honestly foc- focusing on tanking for uh, surefire number one pick, Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence. I'm sure uh, all three of those franchises would love to have uh, a game breaking talent like him. Um, but Aiden, Bills 4-0. I know you're not a big football guy. Um, I know you've sort of adopted them as your team uh, this season, but uh, let me know what you think of having a football team that's in contention along with, obviously, your Celtics as one of the premier teams in the Eastern Conference. Well, it's big-time stuff, Rob. This is their first 4-0 start since 2008, I believe, so 12 years now. And just from being around Bills fans, sort of a funny story, people were actually a little bit excited about the COVID postponement because for a second there, they were like, okay, we're about to get Tuesday night football and then Thursday night football, the bills were slated to kick off for Thursday night. And obviously the NFL sort of uh, shut that down pretty quickly and rightfully so you simply do not play games the day after another in the NFL. Um, It's big time stuff though. And I think that especially, um, you know, with college basketball being put off another couple weeks, I personally am looking forward to picking up football just a little bit more, taking more of a rooting interest now that I actually have something to cheer for in the local sense or semi-local sense. So definitely an impressive start for the Bills. And I'll talk a little bit more about Josh Allen in a bit, uh, but a lot to be happy about. Yeah. And there's really no better time for you, Aiden, because the Bills you know, with such a great start, they haven't won a postseason game since 1995. So if there was ever a time to start rooting for them um, as they're on the come up, you know, you picked the right time and the right year. And uh, before we move on to our assists, fumbles, and what to watch for, just a quick correction. The Seahawks uh, are about to move to 5-0. and Russell Wilson mm. just threw a touchdown to DK Metcalf with 10 seconds remaining. Let Russ cook, as they say. Uh, they, he leads them to their fifth consecutive win uh, and drop the Vikings to one and four, who are really, in my opinion, a contender for that NFC North crown. But it looks like it's all Green Bay and Chicago, my Bears, at four and one uh, as we approach week six. But Aiden, give me your assist for the week. Let me, tell me how Russell Westbrook gave back to his community as he left the bubble after a disappointing series loss to the Lakers. Yeah, you know, it was sort of a a class act we saw from Westbrook. Um, And it's interesting that the story didn't break for multiple weeks after he had already left the bubble. But Westbrook, we found out recently, left an $8,000 tip, a handwritten thank you letter, and most importantly, a spotless room for hotel housekeeping in the NBA bubble in Orlando. And obviously, I know NBA players... They're, they're busy guys. They easily could have left the room a wreck. But the fact that he actually left it spotless to me is nearly as, as impressive as that extremely generous donation. Um, somebody did the math. I, I want to cite a source, but unfortunately forgot to jot it down. That averages out to about $89 a night for the time that he spent in that hotel in Orlando, uh, whereas guests are actually encouraged to tip between $1 to $5 per night of their stay. So Westbrook going above and beyond. And it it shows you what kind of a guy he is. He uh, won the 2014-2015 NBA Cares Community Assist Award. 
And I think that people forget just what a great guy Westbrook is just because of how fiery he is out there on the court, at times borderline petty, but he's genuinely a great guy. And you can ask his teammates also just about who's one of the greatest teammates you've ever had. I know at his cancer, among others, they have said unequivocally, it's Russell Westbrook. Yeah, that's that's a great point you bring up. He, he looks menacing, almost like he wants to hurt you when he's out there playing. He just has so much emotion and athleticism when he's throwing those down. Um, but I, I'd like to have the money to be able to give $8,000 tips to people whenever I want to. And as somebody who never keeps their room clean, uh, I can appreciate what Russell Westbrook did in the bubble. Um, and it's surely indicative of his NBA Cares Award as you uh, toned to earlier. Um, but in, in the light of what was an awful ankle injury suffered by Dak Prescott in the Cowboys win over the Giants today, um, we'd like to not only send him our thoughts and prayers, but also take the time to recognize how much he's done off the field, uh, along with his dominant first four games in which he scored at 12 total touchdowns and thrown for almost 1,700 yards in a contract year, no less. I think Dak is certainly set to get the bag from the Dallas Cowboys at the end of the 2020 season. But Prescott, you know, as if he didn't have enough responsibility and pressure on him as the starting QB for the biggest sports team in America, uh, he recently started his Faith Fight Finish Foundation dedicated to raise awareness for screenings and offer financial assistance to patients of cancer and their families as well as support fitness and wellness programs for students at inner city schools and support artists with severe disabilities. Dak started the foundation in honor of his late mother of seven years, Peggy, who sadly passed away from colon cancer when he was at the start of his college career at Mississippi State. So, you know, this issue runs deep within him and his family. And, you know, yes, he's a star in the field, but you can really say the most for Dak and saying that he's a true role model off the field. And uh, we wish only the best in his recovery and the continuation of his support um, of people uh, fighting cancer and people in um, marginalized communities as well. And I think the outpouring of support for Dak in light of the gruesome injury, it, it tells you all you need to know. Obviously his community work has been tremendous and it shows you why, for instance, his own former head coach was the first person on the sidelines checking on him once he was injured. Um, so once a coach, always a coach, as the saying goes, and Dak Prescott is certainly more than deserving of that. And so moving forward to my fumble segment for this week, um, I just want to address quickly the really less than mediocre TV ratings across the board for all professional sports at this point. We saw a new record low for viewership of the NBA finals across consecutive games, even in games one, two, and three of the finals that really generated alarmingly low viewership rates. And obviously Rob, so much goes into those counts, right? You, you have a lot of people streaming the games illegally, of course. Um, and also, um, you know, you, you, bars aren't showing the games right now because frankly, there are no bars in, today's country or very few. Um, but really, I think what's interesting is a lot of people were um, inclined to point towards the political agenda and messages of the NBA in writing off their low viewership and saying that people were sort of uh, not appreciative of the fact they were detracting from the sport itself. And I think there's definitely something to be said for that argument. But if you look across the board, at what's happening in some of these other sports leagues, you can see that this isn't necessarily the case and that people just are not watching sports right now for whatever reason. According to USA Today, the Stanley Cup viewership for the Stanley Cup finals, it was actually down 61% from just a year ago. And that may play into the matchup that we saw, um, but it doesn't end with the NBA or the NHL. The U.S. Open tennis down 45% from 2019. The Kentucky, Kentucky, excuse me, Kentucky Derby viewership was atrocious as well. And even our beloved NFL, although they've been doing fairly well across the board, they've really been struggling for some inexplicable reason in their Thursday night football games. So 
I really wish I could get at the psyche of the average American and just ask him or her, what's going on with everything that's happening? Have you just forgotten your love for sport? It's, it's really baffled me. And I just, as someone like us, Rob, we work in sort of sports media. We want to know what's going on here. Yeah. And it's, I find it shocking that uh, people don't want to watch the Broncos and the Jets play Thursday night football. Um, yeah, it's a joke, obviously, but, but um, I think the NFL is doing uh, okay. Uh, I read a stat last week that the 49ers Eagles matchup, which in all cases wasn't a horrible game, but it wasn't a premier um, matchup between two teams. They averaged about 11 and a half million viewers. Well, I think it was game three of the NBA finals, which was going on at the same time, got about 1.7 million. So um, I think the biggest thing is it just explains how big football has gotten in this country and, you know, how it dominates other sports when it's on. You mentioned uh, the political climate detracting some viewers. I think that could be true in some cases. Um, I think the fact that it's just an election year probably takes away a lot of people's focus from sports as a whole. I'm sure if you look back at 2016 and 2012 and every election year before then, you probably saw a little less engagement with the sports world as a whole. Um, and, you know, sadly, a lot of people are going through difficult times right now financially and otherwise, and that also may uh, take away from their time watching sports as well. But it, it is weird to think, Aiden, that uh, in a time where you think uh, the majority of America has a little more free time in their hands now that they're staying inside more and not really going out and doing as much that they turn to sports as an outlet from the world's problems. But it's just simply not the case. And maybe that's just because... Um, you don't see sports with as much electricity now with the fans being out. It doesn't add to the atmosphere. It doesn't add to the excitement, but um, the same can't be said for me. I think I've watched more sports in the last five months than I have my entire life. Um, it's not five months, actually. It's more like three, but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. America, wake up, watch more sports. You'll feel better uh, and you'll enjoy yourself doing it. Aiden and I can attest to that. Um, for my fumble, we're going to go to the NFL and talk about one of the game's sharpest and most cerebral players of the last two decades until now. That's Tom Brady, Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback, former New England Patriots quarterback, forgets its fourth down uh, and misses a deep shot to end the game and lose to my Chicago Bears 20 to 19 on Thursday night football. It was fourth down and five, uh, I should mention. So, you know, the Buccaneers didn't need a huge gain. And Brady is seen at the end of that play holding up four fingers uh, in confusion, wondering why the Buccaneers aren't getting another play. And I thought, you know, that was just particularly funny. The, most of the internet uh, felt that was pretty hilarious, too. The Bucs got the ball with a little over a minute remaining after Cairo Santos hit a field goal to put the Bears up. And in, given Tom Brady's history um, with the ball in the fourth quarter, I thought for sure it was over. You know, as much as I'd like to say I was optimistic about the Bears' defense, it was very strong that game. Uh, being able to close it out, two minutes remaining, and Tom Brady uh, don't go well in the same sentence uh, when you're talking about his opponents. But um, it, a rare senior moment, should I say, for the 43-year-old Tampa Bay quarterback. Yeah, Robin, I think that it, to say it was meme worthy is an understatement. I personally have enjoyed seeing some of the responses to that, including like, oh, Tom Brady finally doesn't have Bill Belichick in his ear for the first time in 20 something odd years. So it, it's been entertaining to say the least. And you mentioned earlier the the picture of Jimmy Butler leaned over the the sideline table there. Yeah, we could do a whole show on sports memes and I think come up with a really great podcast on it, but definitely not the best look for Tom Brady as obviously Tampa Bay, they need every win that they can get to sort of stay afloat. Um, so moving on now to our last segment, what, what to watch for in the sports world this week. Um, I want to give a shout out as mentioned to, <laughs> this is not a mental typo, Tuesday night football we have coming up uh, the night after tomorrow um, we, where we have the 4-0 Buffalo Bills taking on the 3-0 Tennessee Titans. And Rob, as I alluded to earlier, the NFL is 
quite furious with Tennessee right now. And so I'm really interested in this matchup to see if the surging Buffalo Bills can sort of take out a lot of this collective anger and steamroll the Titans. It's going to be no small task, obviously. But as mentioned, Bills are off to their first 4-0 start in 12 years. And really, it's been behind the play of their quarterback, Josh Allen, who was just recently named the AFC Offensive Player of the Month for September. And he's been on a roll in more more ways than one. He actually also recently became the first quarterback in Bills history with at least 300 pass yards and three touchdowns in three consecutive weeks. And he actually surpassed Jim Kelly's franchise record for the most passing touchdowns in the team's first three wins as well. So three was sort of the magic number for Josh Allen, although his bills currently stand at four and oh. And so I'm definitely looking forward to once again, Tuesday night football. Yeah. And the bills are rolling right now. And we've talked about them a lot this past episode, but um, Allen was a guy that when he came into the league and started his first two games, there was a lot of speculation about whether or not he was the real deal. And I think that criticism goes all the way up until last year's postseason where you know, the Bills had a, I think, a 16 nothing lead in the postseason against the Houston Texans. And Allen just couldn't get his offense going the second half and close that game out. I think there's um, a few things to knock him on currently. Uh, I think he does miss uh, too many wide open throws every now and then. Um, he needs to work on setting his feet um, and getting his mechanics right as opposed to throwing off balance, you know, can only be so many Patrick Mahomes in the world. And I think Allen, if he finds fine tunes his skill set a little bit more, can get to you know a similar level of stardom. Um, but the way things are going right now, the Bills, you know, they're undefeated, they're at the top of the AFC East. The Patriots have been um, struggling with a tough schedule and you know their own bout of COVID-19. So the East is wide open for the Bills. And um, like I said before, I, I trust them this time around to get their first win in a long time. Future looks bright and I'm sure you're very excited about that. Um, but you know, it wouldn't be an episode of the WCHG Sports Podcast if we didn't talk about tennis. Yes, we're back with tennis, the world sport, um, bringing it here for you guys. The 2020 French Open, we saw this morning number two ranked Rafael Nadal defeating the world number one, Novak Djokovic, who, to be honest, Aiden, has had a bit of a rough summer um, lately with his gaffe in hitting a, an assistant in the face of the tennis ball uh, and being disqualified from that tournament and now losing in straight sets to Rafael Nadal, giving Nadal his 20th Grand Slam title, which matches the most of all time with Roger Federer. Nadal is 102 in his career in the French Open and obtained his 999th career win today, dominating his opponent pretty much all facets of the game. He won 6-0, 6-2, and 7-5. Aiden, I know you've been fiending to talk about tennis. You actually watched this match today, so let's hear a little bit of that expertise um, uh, of what you watched this morning. I did watch it, Rob, and actually I, I was sort of beating myself up for it because between watching um, the French Open final this morning and game six of the NBA finals tonight, I realized I spent five and a half hours, give or take, in front of the TV today. But then I realized that's what most NFL fans do every Sunday anyway, and so I sort of took comfort in that fact. But yeah, I was out playing tennis yesterday, so I was like, okay, let's watch some tennis. And I'm doing some reading and realized, holy cow, history could potentially be made this morning. And so, yeah, 20 Grand Slam titles, that's unbelievable for Nadal and really the convincing fashion in which he did so was even more astounding. Obviously, you mentioned 100 wins and two losses at the French Open. He's absolutely dominated that slam for a decade and a half now. Um, But really, nobody saw what we, uh, nobody saw coming what we watched today. Basically, Djokovic just folded the first two sets. He eventually gathered some momentum. winning five games in that third set, but really he never had a point at which he was looking like the number one tennis player in the world. And he threw a whole lot of drop shots at Nadal 
and Nadal just was not having it. He returned each and every shot brilliantly and just showed that he was more ready to play than Djokovic was. And my one regret is I wish with all my heart that this could have been uh, Nadal's 1,000th win today. He'll have to wait until his next competition to get that. Um, but big time stuff. And I was uh, more than glad to spend my morning watching some tennis. Yeah, and we'll be there for that 1,000th win uh, here on the podcast. Don't you worry about that. Um, going back to Federer and Nadal, it's really rare that you see two players who can easily make the case that they are the greatest of all time playing in the same era and often competing against one another. Um, only a few examples from other sports cross my mind. Obviously, Tom Brady and Peyton Manning being the most profound one uh, in football, they had their fair share of battles over the two decades that they, their careers intersected um, in the NBA. Aiden, I don't know if you could give me any help with this. Um, I, I think Kobe and LeBron's a little bit of a stretch just because I think their respective primes came at different points in their career. Um, you could say Kevin Durant and LeBron, but I mean, when you compare the resumes of those two guys, just given that uh, what's happened tonight, I think that's not a, a fair fight for Kevin Durant as talented as he is and as excited as I am to watch him and Kyrie in Brooklyn next year. Um, yeah. Help me out with, help me out with this. Do you, do you have any examples of uh, players in their respective primes, goats in their primes playing in the same era across any sport? You know, Rob, I think in terms of basketball, you may have to reach back all the way to Bill Russell versus Wilt Chamberlain <laughs> in the 60s, um, primarily, just because, yeah, we did end up having Kobe, LeBron, and obviously you don't consider Durant an all-time or the all-time great. Um, there, there is some overlap. Um, you can't you can't deny that but in terms of concurrent paths um there's definitely nothing really comparable although to be fair Federer is right now he's 39 years old compared to Nadal who's 34 and Djokovic recently turned 33 so in terms of who's going to end up winning more overall you have to look at Djokovic who he was going for I want to say number 18 in grand slams today so um he's obviously only a couple behind the pack now. Um, so I think Nadal has a better chance than any, especially if he keeps dominating these French Open championships. Um, but no, it's a really interesting point you raised just about concurrent paths of greatest of all times and what we've seen. It's definitely a privilege to watch what we have in the tennis world right now, even with the likes of um, Dominic Team, who recently won the Australian Open. Um, and he's ranked number three in the world right now. But at number one, two, and four, we obviously have the big three we just mentioned. So, again, a privilege to watch. Absolutely. Always great talking about tennis with you, Aiden. That's going to be it for episode 11 of the WCHC Sports Podcast. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. And please don't forget to let us know what you'd like to hear us talk about during episode 12 or future episodes, which we'll have for you same time every week, Sunday night. Well, we'll be talking about the World Series next week. We'll be talking about NFL. Uh, maybe we'll sneak in some NBA and tennis if we can, some hypotheticals. Uh, but until next time, this is Rob Murray and Aiden Rupert signing off.